Hi. Hi. Um, we need to be in prayer for our body in all seasons, but especially now because there's a lot of confusion, I would say, out there about this virus and what's going on. Um, we have a number of families who called this week and said that they have been exposed, they feel they've been exposed, they're being tested so they aren't here today. Matt and Candy Greenwood uh, called and said they, they feel like they need to isolate themselves. Um, Phil and Sherry Sanders called and said the same thing. Um, uh, we have other families that uh, have uh, voluntarily isolated themselves and I appreciate that and I'm, I'm grateful that uh, people care for our body and, and they're taking appropriate action. Earlier, uh, Terry mentioned that if you feel uh, like you need to wear a mask, you can do that. Uh, sitting, isolate yourself, you can do that. We certainly have hand sanitizers around. So, you know, we want you to be uh, comfortable in God's house. We don't want you to feel like you're under tension. Now, as far as our congregation, uh, God has blessed us. We don't have any deaths from this virus, thank the Lord. Um, there are a lot of challenges about it, but we just want you to know that uh, people care and that uh, we want you to have a, a good, happy, healthy experience in our church. And to that end, we pray. Let me say a prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are grateful that you have watched over our congregation, that you have blessed us in so many ways. And we pray, dear, dear Lord, you'll be watching over uh, these who have isolated themselves for the Greenwoods, for the Sanders, also for Kelly Moore and for Mike Monk, and uh, Lord, for others that may feel that they needed to separate themselves and just bless them and encourage them and strengthen them. Give them, dear Lord, the desire to be in the word, to listen to the messages on the internet and dear Lord, to be confirmed in their Christian faith daily. And Father, we, we do pray your, your blessing upon those among us who have experienced a loss in these recent days. I pray for Earl Richmond at the loss of his son, and I just pray you'll be blessing and strengthening him. We pray for Mike Monk, the loss of his brother, and we just pray for him and encourage him. And Lord, in these things we know that you are the divine and wonderful and almighty God, and that all things are perfect in your timing. And we praise you for that, and we thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Excuse me, but that is way too close there. I'm going to pull this out. And move this out so I got room back here. It feels funny being backed against the wall. <laughs> ah, I got room to breathe now. Look out. Here we go. So how are we doing this morning? Praise God. Blessed and highly favored, right? Highly favored because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that, Pastor Tom. It's really been weighing on my heart as I look out here and I see all these empty chairs and Again, some of it is from fear, some of it is from actual being sick, some of it is just, to me, it's Satan. When I'm not sitting out there, I know that Satan has a hold on something, you know, illnesses or sickness or whatever it might be. You know, the big question that I have today for us as believers, I've been kind of put on the spot, is who do you serve who do you serve? Who are you in Christ? How do you edify the body of Christ? We each as believers are endowed by the power of the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts. Our brother, elder, teacher mentioned this morning that his is teaching. You know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in Romans chapter 12, there's a lot of examples in there. A lot of examples of what, what these gifts are. They tell us throughout the Bible. 
But upon, upon confessing Jesus Christ as God, as your Lord and as your Savior, you are filled with an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And how do we ignite that Spirit? How do we fan that flame but by an obedience to the Word? And one of those words is that we must come together. Do not forsake the gathering of the Word in Hebrews. These gifts that we have of prophecy, ministry, teaching, giving, mercy, etc., etc., etc. I won't go into the list because it's listed so many, 15 to 18. Some say 21. It depends on what guy you're listening to or what theologian you're listening to. But those spirits are there. Those, those, those gifts of the Holy Spirit are there. And some of us may not discover them for a lifetime. Some of them know right away. Some of us. And some of us may not even know until after we looked at the dust behind us and clear that the gift has been working the whole time. It's been working the whole time. I've had people come to me and say, well, I don't know what my gift is. And, and, and it's like, okay, what do you do? What have you done? What have you done for Jesus lately? What have you done for the gospel? What have you done for the body of Christ? What are you doing for the body of Christ? Juanita, she's ill, by the way. We pray for her. She has pneumonia, but she's doing okay. You see those beautiful flowers out there? This morning, when you pull in the church, she would have been out there nurturing and clipping and watering. And that's a, that's a gift. The smallest of gifts, okay, is not insignificant. Okay? Cut off a toe and see how well you walk. Huh? That's just an example. Close one eye and see how well you walk and not walk into the walls and such. It doesn't matter what part of the body of Christ you are, you're very significant. And as the body of Christ, as the body of Christ, okay, we are the church. We are together as the church. And then there's only one head. And Colossians 1, 1 18. Jesus is the head of the body. He gives us direction. I was in the uh, uh, Proverbs this morning. I was in the Proverbs this morning. Right here. This is part of what it talks about. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Colossians 1.18, God, Jesus, he's the head. So you commit to him, and he'll give you direction. My favorite verse, a lot of you may know it, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Paths, it's plural. Your path at home, your path at work, your path jogging down the road. Whatever your likes are. Whatever your pleasure is, God gives you that. So when we rely on God, where is our path leading? You know, today, we're going to concentrate on the Word. And to what my understanding is, the Word is alive. Okay? And to me, it's Jesus alive. This is the Word of God. And today, I'm going to put us in an area where one might feel all alone. Who do you serve? Now, I'm going to tell you a story. and You've heard this story many times, but I'm going to compress it. Okay? You, as a young man or woman, you're fishing. And then you get done with your fishing trip and you're on the, on the beach and you're mending your nets. And this guy comes by. 
And you see this guy. And he says two words. Follow me. And so this young man in awe of the presence of this guy drops everything he's doing, grabs his brother, and they follow. And so for the next three years, they follow this guy. Hanging on every word. Walking in every step. Wherever he might go. You see water be made into wine. You see the blind giving back their sight. You see the deaf begin to speak and the deaf begin to hear. You see all these miracles going on. And you're hanging on every word. And every once in a while, he's going to mention something that he's going to be killed. That just kind of goes away because you see all this other stuff that's in awe. This is a young man, an impressionable age. Young man. Young woman. And you're following this guy. He's your master now. You've put everything into it. You follow him. You sleep where he sleeps. You eat what he eats. You hang out with him. You see all these miracles. You're on a hillside and there's thousands of people on the hillside. What are we going to feed these people? And a young boy comes up with a basket of just a few loaves and a few fish. And he raises it to the heavens. And you see this going on and you're partaking in this. And you grab one of the baskets and you're feeding these people. 5,000, 4,000. Who is this man? Who is this guy that I follow? It's awesome. And once in a while, again, he speaks of his death. I see all the awesomeness that's going on around me. I'm in an impressionable age. I'm a young boy. And one day as we go to the garden, we're in the garden of Gethsemane. We've been here many times. And we're praying. And I look in just a short distance away as I'm with my brother and, and Peter. And we're there. And I see him off now. Now he looks stressed out. I've never seen him look like this before. He's always been up, uplifting and praying and always been joyful. And healing people. Feeding people. And all of a sudden he's off by himself. And he's crying. He's sweating blood. What's going on here? I don't understand it. This is my master, and he's in, but I can't seem to stay awake. It's like three o'clock in the morning, and I keep nodding off, and he comes back, and he's mumbling something to us, and he's telling us, hey, stay awake, pray with me. And then the next thing you know, here comes a garrison. Here comes a whole guard, and Judas is with them. And Judas walks up to the master and gives him a kiss. Peter draws out his sword, cuts off a guy's ear, and Jesus takes time to pick the guy's ear up and put it back. What is going on here? Wow, this is happening. And then you look around and everybody's gone except me and Peter. So we follow the garrison as they drag Jesus off and now we're in the courtyard. We're wondering, because they let me in. Because I know the guards. So we're in there. And then you see Peter off in the distance by the fire. And he's mumbling something and saying this or that. I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. And the next thing you know, Peter's gone. And the trial happens. All this chaos goes on. I don't remember quite exactly all this stuff that's going on. But the next thing I know, I find myself at the foot of the cross alone. And I see him hanging there on the cross. What have they done to my Lord? And he says these simple words. Son, behold your mother. You're not alone. You're not alone. Put yourself in the position of that young disciple. Don't you feel alone? Wouldn't you feel alone if you're standing there and everybody else has abandoned you? And you're standing there and you're looking up at him and he's hanging on that cross. Keep him up on that cross for a minute. 
Just keep him up there, just in your mind. Is it real? Is this really happening? Is it really real? Do I, am I standing here? Is this all a dream? Is it all a dream? Is it really happening? What a testimony. What a testimony that affected this young man. For so many years, he was able to write the gospel. He was able to write other books in the Bible. He was put out on Patmos for years. Lived to be 90-something years old. They wouldn't touch him because he had something there. There was something about that young man. We can't touch this guy. We can't kill him. There's something about this guy. We can't kill him. Look at all the chaos that was going around. Now, fast forward to here. Look at all the chaos that's going around in the world. They're burning our cities to the ground. Total chaos. Brother against brother. Mother against son. Son against father. It's happening. It's right here. It's right now. What is going on? Is our situation here any different? Do we think we stand alone? Do we think we stand alone? What is your testimony? Who do you look up to? What do you look up to? Where is God in all this? Question after question after question. I see opportunity. I see availability. I see witness, testimony. Where has God brought you from and where are you now? Are you looking up to Him? Are you taking the gift that God has given you and edifying the one next to you? The one across the room. This is the body of Christ, and we are to lift one another up, to help one another. And by golly, this congregation, I am aware of that we do this. Amen. We do this. But we have to stay in constant reminding of why we're doing this. He's on the cross for you and for me. He did it for a reason. And like little John there, is this a dream? Is this, is this really happening? As I look at the news, is this a dream? Is it really happening? As people are dying left and right, I got a friend of mine, his name is Gary. And he's down at the hospital right now, intubated because of COVID-19. He's the bass player for our Christian motorcycle band that we travel around playing. So yeah, it hits pretty close to home. I still don't quite get it. It's still not touching me. It's just still not grabbing a hold of the urgency of what's going on. Because death and destruction is here. Where is God in all this? Is it part of His plan? Is it part of His plan? That's a good question. That's for us to look to God and ask for the questions and ask for the answers. Who are we in this whole world? Who are we? If I stand by myself, I'm lost. If I stand by myself at the foot of the cross and look at Jesus up there on the cross, all I can do is weep and cry and say, my Lord and Savior, now what am I going to do? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what comes next? What comes next? Jesus tells us what comes next before he dies on the cross. He says, I'm going to go and pre prepare, prepare a place for you. And while I'm gone, you're going to do greater things than I am. Because I've only been here three years in the ministry. 33 years on the earth. How many of us in here are older than 33? And greater things we shall do. 
greater things. Testimony. Witness. Gospel. Hanging on that cross is just the beginning of the Gospel. Because it leads to His death. He had to die for us to live. Are we living? Are we using these gifts to live? To edify Christ. The body of Christ. Here we are. And as I look at the news and I'm wondering what's going on, should I go out there? Should I draw my sword like Peter? Or my 12 gauge? Right? What am I to do? Well, number one, this is what the Lord is teaching me and, and I am teaching us in our men's group. Number one, when you get out of bed, you say, good morning, Father. My life is yours. Do with it what you will. I am a disciple. You want me to what? No, wait, wait, wait. There's something else. Let's try something. No, no. Listen to him. Witness. When the opportunity arises. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what's going to happen. Jesus says, before He got hung on the cross, He says, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit's going to speak for you. Oh. Well, how do I do that? Well, you, he says, well, you call upon the Holy Spirit and you ask Him and He will bring to remembrance the things that He's told you, that He's taught you, that you have read, that you have heard through music, through preaching, through teaching, through Bible study, wherever it might be. The more we're involved in the Word, the more we project it. The more you sit in front of that TV, the more scared you're going to get. Okay? I'm not saying that don't wear a mask because you're this or... No, 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 no. I'm not going down there. I'm just saying, where is your heart? Who do you hold up there? Who do you look up to? Now, it is wise to wear a mask when you're supposed to or whatever. Or if you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. I'm not telling you that. What I'm saying is build your strength from within by saying, good morning, Father. I'm here to serve you. Help me. And as soon as you lay down the word and you walk away, you stub your toe, what comes out of your mouth? Right? And we ask forgiveness right away. And He forgives us. 1 John 1, 9. We ask Him, He cleanses us. So as a disciple, what do we do? He says, you take up your cross and you follow me. Wait a minute, you're hanging on the cross. You're still hanging on the cross. Remember that. Just keep that in your head. I grew up 41 years looking at him on the cross. Now, if there's any Catholics in here, I mean no harm or any foul or whatever, but I was raised a Catholic, and every time I walked through that door, he was still hanging on the cross. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, he's gone. He is no longer on that cross. They buried him. And three days later, the stone was rolled away and he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of God. That's the gospel. You remember that. Drill it in your head. And how did it come to you? That's your testimony. What day were you saved? Do you remember? Okay, now I'm not going to boast on this because I remember and you don't. May 25th, 2003. The greatest day of my life was acknowledging, was confessing Jesus as God. My God. And then the rest is up to the Almighty God because I say, Lord, what next? Oh, no, not that one. No, you don't do that. You ask him, what's next? And then we got to do it. But I have a tendency like anybody with God, I need to go mow the yard first. Or, or no, wait, no. I just bought a car. I got to go test drive it. No, wait, wait. Just got married. We're going on our honeymoon. I'll get back to you when we get back. I just bought some land. I got to, wait, 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 no, wait. What do we do? 
when God calls us. You know, when I was in the Marine Corps, there's a few military guys in here, when, when Gunny said, jump, you ask how high on the way up. When Jesus says jump, shouldn't we do the same? Because He laid down His life for me. For greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. And how many of us can call Jesus my friend? I put that question out there to the men's group and one of our men took it home to his children and his children and, and uh, the 14-year-old wrote a little paper. I think it's still hanging on my bulletin board because I thought it was so great. And <clears throat> I asked him, who is Jesus to you? And the very first sentence, Jesus is my friend. And she wasn't in that Bible study. She was just asked the question. And that was the answer. Is Jesus your friend? Who do you look up to? You look up to your friends? I look up to my best friend. What is your testimony? How do we overcome Satan? Revelation 12, 11, You overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. The testimony of your words. What is your testimony? Who do you serve? I'm back to the beginning now. Who do you serve? Who do you worship? Who do you serve? Who do you worship? How, did, how can we handle this? How can we do this? How can we deal with all these problems that are going on here? How can I? Well, let's see. Jesus gave us an example. Okay? Jesus, Jesus gave a really good example. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> this tells us a story of 40 days. But I've been alive for 58 years plus. And you've been alive a few more days than me, right? Not many, right? Right, Pastor? Have you been alive a few more days than me at least? Okay. But for 40 days, Jesus was in the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit and He was tempted. It only gives three temptations, okay? And we'll go over those in just a moment. Chapter 4. I'm going to read a little bit, but bear with me. Chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> if you turn to your Word, it's not on the uh, screen up there. I encourage you to look at your Word, look at your Bible. Translation might be a little different. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So those of you who have the New King James, you're right. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> no. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, you fall down before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Then he brought him to the Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And their hands shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. I'm going to hold there for just a moment. Who do you serve? Who did Jesus say to serve? Now here's a key verse. For what I'm talking about today. 
Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. When you think you got it all together, look out. Because he's circling like a wolf. As Peter puts it, he's circling like a lion looking for somebody to devour. So we need to be vigilant. We need to be sober. We need to be in the Word and we need to be together. I can't stand alone and do this. Pastor Tom and I get together as often as possible and sharpen each other up as steel sharpens steel as Proverbs. What are we doing? We get together in Bible studies People say, wow, you guys sure study the Bible a lot. When you got time for anything else? I don't want time for anything else. <coughs> All I do is watch MASH. <laughs> you know? Or some cop show. And even those are getting bad where I can't stand them anymore. And that's the Holy Spirit working on me. Is He working on you? How are you edifying the body? How are we doing this? Huh? One of my favorite pastimes is this. Right? Am I glorifying God and riding my motorcycle? So I join the CMA, the Christian Motorcyclist Association, and I wear a cross on my back, and it almost looks like the symbol for New Hope Christian Fellowship with a cross and a Bible and praying hands. How significant is that? Is that godly? I don't know. But everywhere we go, we have that patch or those colors on, and people see that, and it plants a seed in their brain. Some will look at it and go, oh, oh, no, no. But some will look, and I'm standing in line at Circle K and tap me on the shoulder. So what's that patch mean? And I would explain to them that I'm a Christian motorcyclist and I travel around the United States and I spread the Word of God. Do you need prayer? And I've prayed for people right there in Circle K in the parking lot. I've prayed in the JB's restaurant, which is now Sholo Cafe. You know, I've... Everywhere, Walmart, Kmart when it was around. What do you do for the service of the king? How do you do it? See, that's, that's a calling right there. Not everybody is called to do that. But I'm just giving you an example of what you can be doing. Ask God. If you're not sure, ask Him to reveal what it is that you do for Him so that you can build it and not put Jesus in a closet. I'm a Christian, but Jesus is in the closet for now. I'll take him out and put him on when I need him. It's not cold enough. What do we do? Who do you serve? Do you actually stand alone in Christ? Look around you right now. Just look around the room. Are you alone? You're not. You're not alone. Because we're all in this together as brothers and sisters, as the body of Christ. And when I look around, I see opportunity. I see availability. I see testimony, witness. You each have your own. And, you know, they say, well, you got you to gotta practice your testimony and keep it under two minutes. How am I going to keep the last 17 years within two minutes? How am I going to preach this sermon in 45 minutes? This sermon is not going to be done today. Because it's going to take three times. So come back to next week and find out what's next. What are you doing? Who do you serve? Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity to be a witness unto you. We thank you, Father God, for your total blessings upon New Hope Christian Fellowship and for all who come to this place. And I pray, Father God, that we come together in your name. Strengthen us. Strengthen us as we are one. As God is one. We thank you for the opportunity for being available to spread the gospel to those in need. In Jesus' name, amen.